Um, good morning, and thank you very much, Ken, for the nice introduction. I would like to thank the dean, uh, the uh, department chairs, and uh, the faculty uh, here at the Arnold School of Public Health for uh, having selected me for this uh, uh, honor to present the Wenberg Lecture this year. I have to confess that this is my first visit to the beautiful city of Colombia and to this school, and I'm really impressed by the by the uh, amount of work and the quality of work that is going on in uh, public health research. So I have um, been invited to uh, give a talk on this uh, broad issue of environmental health. <clears throat> and my own work, as, as Ken said, is mainly in the field of cancer epidemiology. So um, uh, I would present you know, a sort of review of some of the major issues in terms of epidemiological research uh, on environmental cancer, but uh, many of the issues are uh, relevant to other areas of epidemiology research and public health research. So I'd be happy to expand on a number of other tracks, you know, if you think that, you know, this is, uh, is important also. So there is a, um, <clears throat> we are facing, uh, we are in the middle and we are still facing a, a, a big epidemic in, in, in the in terms of the number of cancer cases and cancer death that are occurring in this country and worldwide. These are the global estimates in millions of cases and millions of deaths, uh, which have been produced by um, the World Health Organization for 2012, uh, 8 million deaths and 14 million new cases of cancer. But what is more important is that this is keep increasing, and the estimates for 2012, uh, the uh, projections are in the order of 17 million uh, new cases of cancer and 10 million of death. So what are the causes? What are, and, uh, and sorry, just one uh, important aspect here is that um, the increase is mainly taking place in uh, countries uh, with uh, uh, low resources. I divided here the number of uh, cancer. These are just for, um, for men, I think, but it's just to give an idea. High income countries and low and medium income countries, the number of cancer deaths for, um, in 2002 and 2012, sorry, there is a mistake here, it's 2012, uh, comparing the increase, uh, and as you see that there is a, still uh, the number of cancer deaths is increasing in high income countries, US, Europe, Australia, Japan, etc. But the largest number, the large increase is taking place in the order of 3% per year, which is very large in low and medium income countries, countries that have limited resources to face uh, the cancer epidemic in terms of uh, treatment, and therefore prevention becomes even more important in those countries. So there are really three components that explain this large increase and the switch in the cancer burden from uh, what used to be considered the main uh, area for cancer, which are the developed countries, to low and medium income countries. There are three components. One is the growth of the population, uh, and the second is the aging of the population. Cancer has many other chronic diseases, and by large, these considerations also apply to many other chronic diseases, cardiovascular disease, uh, neurodegenerative disease, chronic respiratory disease, etc. So the, the growth of the population, the aging of the population, being cancer, a major, most cancers have a, a strong uh, age dependence in, in, in their incidence and mortality. And then uh, there is a third component, which is probably the most interesting uh, one, which is uh, the changes in the pattern of risk factor for cancer and uh, switching from a sort of traditional uh, lifestyle and traditional um, habits into a, a, a sort of a more uh, industrialized and, and urban environment uh, with changes in, in, in many aspects, including changes in, in environmental and occupational risk factors. This is just to give an idea. Uh, this is the world population in 2005. The estimate in, 2009, in 2030, uh, the point is not only the overall increase, but is mainly, and this is familiar with everybody who has been working on, on global health issues or whatever, not only the inc overall increase, but the shift in the distribution with a much bigger increase in the number of people in uh, middle age and old age compared to uh, uh, 
the past. I mean, so these are the people who are going to develop more and more cancer and other chronic diseases. And if we go into a bit more detail, I just want to present one example of this contribution of the different components to the to the risk of cancer and to the future, uh, uh, at least for the in terms of. Uh, Projections, you know, we, we can be wrong, you know, obviously projections are always difficult to, 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 to do in a very precise way, but at least gives a sort of a framework, you know, on how to look at this problem. The, the example that I chose is an easy one, which is lung cancer, because it's mainly derived, it's mainly driven by one particular risk factor, which is tobacco smoking. They choose China because we have relatively good data, and obviously the population is very large and it contributes a lot to the overall cancer burden. So um, these are the, uh, in, in, in green, are the number of cancer deaths that are occurring in China today. Obviously these are estimates because we don't know the number precisely, but you know they're reasonably estimated. And the yellow bars are the estimates in 2030 if uh, just taking into account the aging and the growth of the population. So just the, the demographic change in, in the population. What is interesting in cancer, in lung cancer, is that, as you said, we know, based on the experience in many other countries, that it's mainly driven by the uh, tobacco consumption, uh, with some uh, latency of about 20 years or so. And we are all familiar with the data from the American Cancer Society on the, on the, on the epidemic of lung cancer and tobacco smoke in the U.S. So what we did in this particular case was to use the example of one of the countries that had the most mature epidemic of tobacco-related lung cancer, which was Scotland, because it's in, in the UK the epidemic started even earlier than in the US, and now we see really the whole story going through. So what we, used, what, we, what we did in this exercise was to use the experience of Scotland, in particular among men, to predict what may happen in China if China goes to follow the same pattern. So basically what we did was to say, well, today the rate of lung cancer in uh, Chinese men is about 40 per 100,000, and uh, this was uh, the rate in uh, Scotland at some point during the increase, during the uh, um, uh, part of the, of, the, of the epidemic for lung cancer, which was still uh, very much an increase. What would happen 20 years from now if China would follow the same experience as what I, we have seen in Scotland, but U, U, U.S. would be the same, etc. Well, in fact, in 20 years, there will be the top of the epidemic. It will be in the order of maybe 80 per 100,000, the rate of lung cancer, because uh, this is what we have, we have been seeing in many other countries. Well, if you factor in this change in rate, not just the change in the, in the structure of the population, but the increase in the, in the actual risk of cancer because of, the, of this um, epidemic of tobacco-related lung cancer, we obviously see, we can, we predict a much bigger increase in the number of lung cancer. So basically, we factor in, you know, this shift from the rate that we see today to the rate that we may expect to see in 20 years or so. So now, whether this will happen, we don't know, and obviously we hope that it will not happen. We hope, on the other, on, in other words, that the Chinese experience will not follow the Scottish or the US or the UK or whatever experience, but this is what we can sort of foresee based on what we know in terms of uh, tra past trends that can be used for predicting future trends. So this is just to give an idea of how important these three components, uh, aging of the population, growth of the population, uh, but changes in the risk factor, and I just use one example, are to uh, determine the uh, epidemic and the rates of lung cancer. So, what do we know in terms of the causes of cancer? Um, a few years ago, I had been involved in a, in a systematic review of the causes of cancer in, in uh, uh, France, and then we applied the same approach to a number of other countries, in particular some of, these, uh, uh, some of the uh, newly developed countries like China, Brazil, but also Korea and, and Japan. And when you really try to distill what is known, in what are the important causes of human cancer, uh, one comes down with about 10 uh, groups of causes. Uh, and I know that some people may disagree on some details. I mean, there is obviously a lot of areas where uh, the evidence is a little bit unclear, but basically we have obviously some cancer that are genetics. Then we have some of the major causes of cancer that has been known for 
some time, although, for example, for the, in the case of chronic infection, we have been learning a lot in the last, you know, 20 years or so with many important uh, um, infectious causes of cancer that has been identified. The, the whole area of diet, including uh, weight and physical activity, and I know that this is a particular area of very uh, strong research going on here in the Arno School. And then there are a few other f uh, areas, including in particular occupational environmental factors, where we know quite a lot about it. When uh, people try to do estimate of the contribution of these uh, combined uh, causes, I mean, and possibly their interactions, etc. Uh, there has been a number of exercises done in different countries, including the one we did, as I said, in a few countries. And we come up with this estimate of about half to two thirds of cancer that are uh, attributable to uh, this constellation of causes of, of cancer, these uh, different risk factors. So we still don't know quite a bit in, 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 in terms of the etiology and the causes of cancer at the population level. And if you think uh, um, there are important cancers, I don't know how many of you are familiar with, the, I'm just going a little bit more into the detail, but there are a number of important cancers that uh, we know very little in terms of environmental or uh, known genetic factors. Prostate cancer is probably the most striking example. It's a very important cancer, second most common in men, and yet we, we know a number of genes that explain a little bit, maybe five, 10 percent. And beyond that, we know very little about the possible contribution of these of these causes to prostate cancer. And this is despite a lot of work, a lot of studies in, in epidemiology and clinical, etc. Now, uh, let's focus now on the on the issue of environment and cancer. And uh, um, there are basically uh, well environment. I'd, Many of you are working on, on, on the Department of Environmental Health, so I don't need to, to, to tell you. But basically, it has a, a, a sort of a, a little bit, it's a sort of broad definition of environment. And we want, we need to really dis understand what we are talking about. Uh, well, this is the dictionary definition, which includes, you know, obviously a, a, a number of sort of factors that uh, may affect uh, uh, living organism in particular may cause disease, but also cultural and social factors that also are influencing uh, disease. So uh, this uh, uh, sort of um, broad definition is reflected, uh, I think, in the use of public health because there are at least two ways to, you, in which uh, environment is used when we talk about environmental health or cancer or whatever. On the one hand, uh, People sometimes talk about environmental factors when we talk about everything which is not genetic, everything that is modifiable, including diet, including infectious disease, including all these other factors that I showed before in terms of possible risk, risk of cancer. And for example, when people talk about gene environment interaction, that's the way often this is used. I mean, including gene tobacco interaction, gene alcohol interaction, or whatever. On the other hand, we obviously have in mind this more restricted way to think about environment, which is uh, all the contamina uh, all uh, factors that are part of the um, external media that uh, we have really little control about, or, or whatever we want to define it. I mean, and this includes air pollutants, water pollutants, soil, food, etc. And in fact, I, I will. Uh, I will concentrate on this more narrow uh, definition of environment, although, as I said, I would be happy to discuss it in a broader sense. When we did our estimate of the role of the known risk factors in shaping the burden of cancer uh, in, in France, and I said I've been involved in some other projects in, in other countries, um, we ended up with, you know, these 10 or so causes, and the uh, overall estimate was about 50 percent, I mean 40 percent or whatever in men. And in fact, uh, I, as you see here, the contribution of environmental factors in the, in the narrow sense was considered to be very small, and I will discuss this more in detail now. But uh, uh, this is clearly, a, 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 an, um, well, we didn't include air pollution at that time, and I will come back to this, but um, the, um, this reflects, you know, our sort of partial understanding of the, of the causes of cancer. And uh, the, fact, the very fact that we came up with a relatively small overall proportion of cancer attributable to the different causes is, is another example of that. So what are the established environmental causes of cancer in this more narrow way? Um, 
as, as Ken Moon said, I've been working for, for a few years, for about 20 years, in fact, at the International Agency for Research on Cancer, and IARC has a sort of um, compilation of known causes of human cancer, known and suspected and, and possible causes of human cancer. Uh, for, those you, for those of you who are familiar with this, it's called the IARC monograph evaluations, and in particular, these evaluations have a list of agents that are put in what is called group one, and these are the sort of the established human carcinogens. When we look at the environmental factors in this list, it comes up to a relatively short list. As you see here, it's um, uh, ambient air pollution, a number of components that are mainly important under the general rubric of indoor air pollution, radon, and secondhand tobacco smoke, um, indoor air pollution from coal, uh, coal burning, and then asbestos and a few other uh, similar fibers. And then uh, one water pollutant, which is arsenic. There are a few suspected uh, environmental causes of cancer, and I will come to this in a minute. I will describe briefly these five or six uh, causes of environmental causes of cancer. So for uh, uh, illustrating mainly some of the methodological issues, I think. So outdoor air pollution. Uh, the, a major issue that, you know, most of what we know in terms of outdoor air pollution is based on agents that are not carcinogenic per se, like uh, uh, sulfuric and, uh, and nit nitric oxides. And uh, um, most of the data available from historical, uh, which may be used, you know, to reconstruct uh, exposure in epidemiological studies, are based on this uh, pollutant that are not only non, not, not carcinogens per se, but they are also usually poorly correlated with important factors. So um, try to use those data to understand the, uh, uh, the strength of the association and those response or whatever usually don't work very well. Um, there has been more focused in, in the recent uh, studies on uh, fine particles, in particular PM2.5, but the amount of good quality prospective studies which have data on PM2.5 is limited, and we will see them in a minute. The other important issue, I think, for outdoor air pollution study is that an you know, exposure assessment is mainly at the ecological level, which introduces, as you well know, exposure misclassification, which tend to attenuate uh, associations, at least under some, under some circumstances. Um, the ability to distinguish the contribution of, of, of specific components of air pollution is limited. And, and a diesel has been probably the one which has been given the most attention, but again, it's very difficult to really have good data on the contribution of diesel exhaust, for example, in the total air pollution. Then there are obviously important issues in, in, in these epidemiological studies, like uh, the contribution of occupation, oftentimes, people living in the most polluted areas of cities or whatever tend to have also the most heavily exposed jobs into uh, lung carcinogens and other factors that may be confounders related to social class. So it's really uh, one of the major challenges to, to, to disentangle these different contributions. Again, it's nothing new for epidemiology, but it's particularly important and, and illustrates some of, some of the issues. So these are the key studies on PM2.5 and lung cancer, which has been used in a, in a recent IARC evaluation for uh, I, um, air pollution to be classified as human carcinogens. Um, well, obviously, we don't need to go into the detail of all these studies, uh, just to show that, you know, the number of lung cancer uh, was not large, except in this last European pooled analysis. This is a pooled analysis of 14 different studies. Um, these are the risk estimates, uh, relative risk uh, in, in, in terms of the slope of the dose response for uh, per, per a, uh, a given increase in the exposure to PN2.5. For example, the relative risk was 2.2 in this study of no smokers. These were uh, uh, done in, in uh, six areas of, oh, sorry, this is six areas. This was done in a, in a group of no smokers in California. So for a 24.3 uh, microgram per cubic meter increase in 2.5, the relative risk was 2.3. And you see there are some uh, heterogeneity in the risk estimates. However, these uh, studies tend to show maybe a 5 to 10% increase per 5 to 10 microgram uh, cubic meter, which is 
quite a bit, is, is a strong uh, association. However, one important aspect I want to show to you, and we'll come back to this, is that for some of these uh, studies, there was um, the, the, um, uh, the, the exposure was basically based, was based on the residents in a, in a given period of time, and, the, uh, and were linked you know, with some pollution data from that period. And sometimes the period of exposure overlaps with the period of follow-up, which is the period here. So for example, in the uh, CPS2 study, uh, the average uh, um, pollutant level used for assessment of exposure was in the early 80s. And this was also the time when follow-up started. And, and we know that you know, we need to have some latency between exposure and disease for cancer. And therefore, on a, from a qualitative point of view, hazard, whether there is a risk or not, is probably good enough because the people, the groups that were ex highly exposed in the 80s were probably also highly exposed in the 60s. From a quantitative viewpoint, however, there are more, more issues, I think. So when people apply these estimates, and this has been using the American Cancer Society estimate of the risk of 1.08 per 10 microgram. When people applied it to some uh, scenarios of exposure, this was a study done in France, looking at two particular cities, it came up with a pretty high proportion of total lung cancer that are attributable to uh, this uh, uh, air pollution. For example, in, the, in Paris, the average PM 2.5 was 18, and this was done from, the, uh, from a study in the early 90s, which would correspond to about 13% of total cancer, which are attributable to uh, cancer. And 13% reflects about, uh, of lung cancer reflects about 2% of total cancer. So it would be quite a sizable proportion. As I said, uh, the, use of the use of recent exposure data is a little bit problematic, in my opinion, because uh, it tends to overestimate the dose-risk relationship. I mean, if, you, if we underestimate your exposure level because you use recent data, although the cancer were caused by past exposure uh, 20 years earlier when the levels were higher, if you underestimate your exposure level, you overestimate your dose response. I hope this is, this is clear. And in fact, in the CPS2, in the paper by Pope, with, the, with Dan Kruski, Michael Toon, et cetera, they did some uh, sensitivity analysis, and when they used uh, more recent data, they found, you know, a much lower uh, sorry, when they used older data, they found much lower risk estimated compared when they used more recent data, which makes sense, I mean, because obviously the lower the, your exposure data, the higher the risk estimate. So, uh, again, there is little doubt that heavy higher pollution causes lung cancer. How much and what the, the, those response relationship is a bit problematic. And this is another issue to consider. This, again, was a nice paper published a few years ago in the environmental perspective by the, the same group of people using CPS2, the American Cancer Society data. Um, this is a dose response for very high level of PM2.5 exposure, which is based on smoking, basically. Just uh, try to quantify the amount of PM2.5 from smoking. And then here is the extrapolation at low dose with the two estimates from the uh, air pollution studies. And you see that you know, both are, tend to be a bit higher. About, well, it, not quite a bit, because in fact it's about three, four, three times higher compared to the sort of linear dose response that you would expect by fitting the smoking data down to the, to the very low level. So there is uncertainty here, and there is some suggestion that some of the uh, estimates may need to be recalibrated or whatever. And then, obviously, there is an issue of potential residual confounding. So that's for air pollution. Let's move, I move quickly to some of the other uh, lung carcinogens, again, mainly to illustrate you know, the um, issues and, and problems, et cetera. This is radon, uh, which is quite important, uh, as, uh, in, and probably not so well uh, studied. Uh, the, I think the best evidence comes from a pooled analysis of 13 studies, which were done, in, in fact, in Europe where traditionally the, the, the work on radon has been probably more, more, more uh, detailed than, than in other parts of the world. This was done by Sarah Darby from Oxford, uh, now about 10 years ago. And they came up with this dose response, you know, when they pooled all the individual data. That's a very nice example of, of the power of pooling individual level data into sort of large, not really meta-analysis, but meta-analysis of, of, uh, of individual records. And their estimate was, uh, in, in a relative risk of, again, 1.08, uh, excess risk of 
per an increase of 100 uh, becquerel for cubic meter, which is um, uh, pretty large because, in fact, for example, in France, and again, we use it to estimate our uh, uh, French study, the average uh, exposure on the population level is 54, 54 becquerel per cubic meter, but still, it means that about 4% of total lung cancer may be due to uh, radon. One advantage of radon is that exposure tends to be relatively stable. It depends, obviously, where people live, so it depends how good uh, the residential data uh, are in epidemiological studies, how much migration there is, how long people live in their houses, etc. But by and large, the, uh, uh, the uh, amount, I mean, the exposure in a given setting remains relatively stable. And uh, well, this was another example of how informative this combined analysis can be. They, st they uh, stratify their results by age and found, for example, no effect in, in young people. I hope, you, I mean, this, you can read this uh, forest plot. I mean, it's just uh, the relative risk and, and the confidence interval for the different categories. Um, another interesting result is that there is no association with squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. Maybe we go into much, too much detail, but uh, lung cancer is made of four major histological types, and there are growing evidence that the uh, etiology may be different. And the strongest effect is for small cell carcinoma, which is not very common, it's about 15% of total lung cancer, but is the most aggressive and the most uh, lethal form of the disease. Second-hand tobacco smoke, we've been, there have been many studies, about 50 case control studies, about 10 uh, core studies. When we did our estimate of the attributable fraction from France, we used basically data from some of the large studies, some of which I, I was involved in also myself, and we came up, you know, with the uh, estimate of the order of 5 to 10 percent, mainly from, mainly for women, obviously, because the number of uh, 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 women exposed to secondhand smoke is higher, at least in the past, because they used to be, there were more men smoking, so it was more common for a non-smoking woman to be married with a smoking man than the other way around. And, and, and this was the estimate of the relative risk, the proportion of exposed, I mean, I don't think we need to go into much detail, but these are the proportion of uh, lung cancer in, in never smokers. I mean, we did not consider smokers because uh, the contribution of secondhand smoke in smokers is very difficult to, to estimate. And we replied this uh, uh, attributable fraction for both um, uh, workplace, sorry, for both uh, workplace and, and, and uh, uh, I mean, household uh, residential exposure, we came up with, you know, this sort of uh, 10 to 20 percent of lung cancer in never smokers due to environmental tobacco smoke. This fortunately is from the past. Nowadays, exposure to secondhand smoke has decreased dramatically. M less and less people smoke. Um, most workplaces are smoke-free, so hopefully this is sort of disappearing now. Uh, what is interesting is less known, at least for people not involved in, in, in global uh, cancer epidemiology, is the importance of other sources of indoor air pollution. In particular, the whole issue of using uh, coal in, under circumstances of poor ventilation of high exposure. And in fact, there has been a number of studies done mainly in East Asia, in China and Taiwan. And this is a recent meta-analysis done by uh, Dan Hosgood, who is now at, uh, at Einstein in, in New York, uh, showing that um, the uh, overall relative risk for women, this mainly non-smoking women from China, for women living uh, exposed to um, a high level of indoor air pollution from, from, and we will discuss in a minute what it means, is in the order of twofold. And in fact, there were uh, some suggestions that, you know, for if you really restrict to never smokers, it's even higher, although most of the women are, are never smokers. And there is uh, some very nice examples of how important this uh, indoor air pollution may be, or may have been at least in the past. This is a study done in this area, a series of studies done in this area, Shuan Wei, uh, in the Yunnan province of China, where in the 70s there were these extremely high rates of mortality from lung cancer, both in men and women. 20 per 100,000 was about, as you see here, about uh, <coughs> three and a half fold for um, men and almost tenfold higher than the average for China in women. And this was really due to the high level of indoor pollution from use of smoky coal under unvented peat. And the interesting thing is that, you know, this result stimulated 
a, a, an intervention to remove and to replace uh, stoves and to increase the ventilation system into the, into the house. And in fact, there were some uh, environmental studies showing that, you know, with the, with the, incre with the improvement in the, in the ventilation and the change in the, in the type of, you know, equipment that was used, the level of exposure to particulate and to benzopyrin, one of the major carcinogens, decreased immensely. And there has been now results from a uh, core study, and these are some of the examples of, of this uh, exposure. There is, for example, a study of 21,000 residents in this area, 80% of them changed to the, to the new uh, improvement, improved situation. And you see that the relative risk now with about 20 years follow up from the changes in the late 70s, 20, 25 years, uh, there has been about half, uh, I mean, the, the, the relative risk is about uh, 0.5, I mean, there has been halving of the risk of lung cancer. And you see here, these are the people, who, men and women, who remained in, uh, um, in, uh, uh, with the poor ventilator and the one with the changes, I mean, and there was this major change. And by the way, there has been some interesting molecular epidemiology studies done in these populations where they showed that the pattern of mutation in P53 for the women exposed to the smoky coal was very similar to the pattern that is found in smokers with a high proportion of this type of mutation, which is a G2T transversions, while, uh, which is not common in never smokers. And again, it's not common in Asian women, which are not exposed to the high level of pollution, while it's extremely common in this group of uh, um, uh, lung cancer in, in this group of women with high exposure. So there is a sort of fingerprint of um, heavy indoor air pollution from coal burning, which is comparable to the one found in smoking. Uh, just a few, uh, just going quickly, asbestos exposure, there are uh, a few studies looking at environmental non-occupational exposure to asbestos. Obviously, the asbestos is major, a major problem in terms of occupational exposure, and we are still looking at the legacy you know, of this effect. There are still uh, probably a few cancers, in particular mesothelioma, that are due to non-occupational exposure to asbestos. These are some of the meta-analyses that we did a few years ago. There were several, seven studies on mesothelioma from household and residential exposure, with a relative risk uh, overall in the order of three or four. And uh, there are not very good data on how many people may be exposed to asbestos at these sort of levels that may cause an increase in mesothelioma. But overall, there are probably a, a few cases that are due to asbestos. Anyway, when we put all this together, we came up with these numbers for, for in the project from France without taking outdoor air pollution, as I said, into account. And you see that we came up with a relatively small proportion, maybe one or a bit more than 1% of total cancer, although the number will increase if we add air pollution, we said it will probably go to 3 or 4%. And the largest contribution, at least in our assessment, was due to radon. Whether this is true or whether this is due to the fact that radon is easier to measure and we have better data, we have more precise uh, relative risk, etc., that's, that's really a big question. And maybe a lot of what we don't know very much about in terms of environmental cancer is because of limitation of epidemiology. There are a few other causes that are highly suspected. I have no time to go through all of them, just mention a couple. There is the interesting story that uh, chlorine, chlorination byproducts, uh, byproducts of, of chlorination water may cause cancer, in particular bladder cancer. And obviously there has been a lot of work done on, on organic chemicals in particular that is, are present in the environment and how can be the contribution to to cancer, and I just mentioned a few here. Um, in terms of water, chlorination byproduct is, I think, is fairly, it's fairly convincing, in my opinion. I mean, there, is a, a, there are a number of studies, and there is a nice meta-analysis. In fact, it's a pooled analysis of, of primary data published now about 10 years ago by the group in, in Spain, in Barcelona, showing, you know, quite, uh, not a very strong association, but quite consistent association of, of the order 1.2 for bladder cancer for high level of, for an increase, uh, for have high level, I mean, uh, more than one microgram liter of three halomethane, which is this uh, group of, you know, chemicals formed by chlorination. And when we try to apply it to the French population, again, as part of our French project, we come up with about 3% of bladder cancer that may be due to uh, exposure to chlorination. In this case, obviously, we are facing the dilemma, which is very common in public health, of risk versus benefit. I mean, uh, the benefit of water chlorination are uh, 
enormous. Uh, whether we should consider using other ways for other approaches for uh, water disinfection because of this possible health effect in terms of bladder cancer is something to, to consider. In terms of uh, organic uh, pollutants, uh, this is uh, probably the most difficult area, at least in my, in my opinion, which have been confronted. Uh, evidence for, for a cancer risk comes from occupational studies. You know, we know that a number of occupational groups are exposed to high level of dioxin, solvents, etc., and there is strong evidence for uh, several associations. However, when we look at the effect in uh, environmental uh, type of exposures, the, the data are much less clear. And again, it may be uh, due to a limitation of epidemiology, so the big issue is how much we can use epidemiology to estimate those risks and how much we want to go with model and extrapolation, etc. For example, uh, one good example, I think, is dioxin. This had the risk of cancer in, the, in one of the important populations that has been studied over the years for environmental exposure. These are people from a, a city in, in northern Italy called Seveso. Probably some of you who have been working on dioxin know these studies, uh, which have been uh, exposed in 1976 to an in, to a industrial accident. And in fact, these people had pretty high level and the number of, of people develop chloracne, which is a, an indicator of high level of exposure. Yet, now we have data with about 30 year uh, follow up in terms of cancer, and there is very, very little evidence that there is an increase in cancer. The standardized incidence ratio compared to the sort of the regional population is a little bit below one for those for the for the sort of the broader area with very little exposure. And uh, in for the one with the highest exposure, the one we had high proportion of chloracne, high level of dioxin in blood, etc. The relative risk for uh, cancer is in the order 1.0, whatever. It's below 1.1 and with very wide confidence interval. So the evidence, for example, for this population that there is an epidemic of cancer due to the uh, industrial accident is, is limited. Okay, so I'm sort of wrapping up. Estimate of the contribution of environmental causes of cancer. What we know, as I said, most of the estimates are in this small range, maybe 1%, maybe 4%, or whatever I mean, but in that range. And there are important uh, factors for which we know relatively little. As I said, the whole area of indoor air pollution is, we, 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 we glance a few things, but we don't have a full picture. Uh, contamination of drinking water, for example, by arsenic is important in many settings, and in fact, in some populations, this is important cause of cancer. In Bangladesh, northern China, sorry, northern Chile, um, Taiwan, etc. There are areas I didn't have time to discuss, but that's a very fascinating area where environmental exposure to asbestos is important, where there are major uh, um, contamination of the ground, uh, of, the, of, the, of the material used for building material, for example, that are contaminated by asbestos or, or, or similar fibers like irionite. And there are areas where epidemics of mesothelioma have been described, like in Cappadocia, in central Turkey, in, in another area of Yunnan in China. So how to deal with the limitations of our knowledge. I mean, uh, we, I went quickly and tried to, under, to, to uh, describe you know, some of the limitations. I mean, obviously we need to improve our epidemiological studies. I see three areas to improve. One is to do larger studies where we need, because we need to identify smaller risks probably. You, know, you remember the graph, for example, for uh, outdoor air pollution and, and, uh, and lung cancer compared with smoking, we are looking at much, much lower exposure. And there is now more and more work done to try to combine the data and to create you know, consortia and network of collaborators to work you know, on similar projects to, to improve you know, the precision of our study. Uh, improving exposure assessment is really the main, the main issue. And I will have a next slide on that. And sort of related to this is try to use more biomarkers of exposure and effect. And probably some of you are familiar with this uh, idea of trying to integrate exposure across life, you know, which is uh, sometimes called the exposome uh, approach, which would be try really to integrate all both the uh, external exposures and the sort of the internal uh, uh, um, markers of possible uh, uh, carcinogens like, you know, inflammatory markers, lipid peroxidation markers, etc., and the microbiome, etc., into uh, one sort of um, 
uh, uh, multiplex type of uh, measurement of many different you know, factors together. That's a nice idea. There have been a few examples, a few attempts to do it, for example, applied to the enhanced data, etc. I see it more like a framework, uh, whether, you know, how far we can move in this direction, obviously, is a, is a, major, is a major challenge that we face today. These are some of the areas for priority, in my opinion. I mean, the fact that we are really need to look for different uh, time windows of exposure. And there is now more and more interest in the possibility to look at uh, cohorts of children, to look at exposure to environmental factors throughout, you know, life in particular, early life. Well, I discussed this a little bit. And there is a whole issue of uh, what happens when people are exposed to more than one agent. That's extremely difficult to study in epidemiology because of the numbers, but at least it can be done in, a, in, in some sort of modeling type of form. And there is some work now that start to be done there. And obviously there is the issue of genetic uh, susceptibility. So, in conclusion, for many environmental pollutants we have relatively poor epidemiology data. Um, we glimpse something, there are some signals, but we are far from having a very strong, consistent uh, evidence that allows us to quantify, to understand, etc. This is not a reason for preventing uh, pro uh, public health uh, activities, and oftentimes the same agents are also important for non-cancer outcomes, so this obviously is, is, is a purely, but my considerations are in terms of research, and, and not in terms of, you know, need for, for intervention and for, for but uh, I think we should use this really to understand the limits of our uh, current knowledge and, and where we can do better. Um, there are a lot of challenges and I try to describe some of them, you know, jumping from one area to the other. Having said that, I think uh, I remain convinced that, you know, studying environmental causes of cancer remains a, a, a high priority, not only because it's something that I do, at least part of my work, but because there are a number of other important considerations. This is an involuntary exposure. So, in a sense, you know, there is more, uh, 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 I think there is a, a higher level of moral obligation to study something for which people are no, well, one should study everything, but in, in a way the fact that people may be exposed without knowing it, or without choosing it, you know, is, gives a, to me a particular flavor to this issue. And importantly, we know, we know how to prevent it, I mean, and in fact there has been a lot of examples, I mean, asbestos is a good example, I mean, clearly exposure to asbestos in the population at large has diminished a lot, you know, given that still is, is still present, it's still important to study, but it's much lower than in many other that it was in the past. And also the fact that, as I briefly said, but it would be important, it would be nice to expand on this. Uh, what we learn and what we understand in terms of environmental causes of cancer uh, is applicable, is relevant in many instances to other chronic diseases. So these are the people who have been helping me working on these issues and, and think about this. Uh, the late uh, Professor Tubiana from Paris, who was the initiator of this project in France, and then a number of colleagues, including Ken, uh, which have been, you know, sort of working over the last few years. Thank you very much for your attention.